how how big these partnerships are. At the time of John Madden's death in 2021, Madden sold over 130 million copies. This game was insanely, insanely successful. Collecting $1 billion worth of quarters. You are now listening to the MVP podcast where we explore the business of sports. My name is Courtney. And I'm Jimmy. And on this episode, we're going to talk about the business of sports video games. And the reason why is because lately I've been playing a lot of EAFC 24 and I got to thinking, I never heard of this game before, but I've played this game before. It used to be called FIFA, but why did FIFA drop the name FIFA in 2024? Well, the short answer is that the Fédération Internationale de Football Association Okay. Them boys, them boys got greedy. But the real answer, well, in order to give you that, we need to go back a long time and talk about why an American video game took the name of an international soccer federation in the first place. So in this episode, we're going to cover the evolution of sports video games. We're going to talk about the godfather of gaming and introduce you to somebody who without him, we don't even know if we'd be playing games the way they are today. We're gonna unpack the business of licensing and its influence on the video games that we actually see in the marketplace. And then you're gonna hear the incredible stories behind the most iconic titles ever created. So without further ado, this is Inside the Business of Sports Video Games. Let's get it. All right, so Courtney, do you know what the first video game is? The first video game ever or like the first, the first one video game ever created? Was that was that Pong or or what? You're close. You're very close. Now Pong is the game that took over the industry, but the very first video game was invented in 1958. It was Tennis for 2. Very first video game invented by William Higginbottom. Now, William Higginbottom was a physicist and he had a laboratory. And the reason why he created this game was so that when people came to his lab, he wanted them to hang out. Now, do you know what this amazing game was invented on? Tennis for two in yeah. 19, 1958. Listen, 1958. I don't want to sound like one of them crazy young kids, but I didn't think that we had TVs in 1958. Yeah, I'm sorry, Grandpa. I'm sorry. But, like, did they have... Man, them had TVs in the 58? No. Listen, they, this was invented on something called an oscilloscope, which is used to measure electrical currents. So they, they unplugged they unplugged the, the heartbeat monitor at the hospital and hooked up a video game to it. Is that what you're telling me? Pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. So this is this is the, the the inception of sports video games as a tennis game. And from there, the actual first game was invented by a Japanese vending machine company. And they also made jukebox, which was called Crown Soccer Special in 1967 by a company named Taito. So essentially, in the late 60s, all the way to 1979, before we get, you know, real consoles, a bunch of companies were creating all types of sports games. You have your baseball, you've got your basketball, you've got your uh, table tennis, pong, all sorts of these different games, but they were all made on arcade systems. So they were called arcade cabinets at the time. Now, you mentioned pong, which... Yo. I, are you talking about like the arcade arcade? Because I used to go to the arcade and get it in. Yes. Those were the first uh, first video game. We could call them consoles. First video okay. game consoles, they were arcade cabinets. So when you went to the sports bar or when you went to the bar, when you went to the sports bar, wherever you went, they would mm. usually have an arcade system there. And those were the first sports video games. Those were those was those hosted the, the first sports video games. So when you mentioned Pong, that was released in 1972. That Pong video game, which is a, is a supposed to be a derivative of tennis, was Table the tennis. first ping yeah, pong, ping pong. Was the first um major explosion of sports video games. In fact, it was such a hit that for bars, it would make them anywhere from $30 to $40 a night. 
And that was virtually unheard of at the time. And so from there, you get everybody just trying to make any sort of sports video games. You had baseball, you had sports video, you had our, our racing video games, you had football, you had basketball. But a lot of these games were just, you know, a rudimentary attempt at making a, sim, uh, a sports video game. They weren't real. They were more like they simulated Pong. It'd be like hit the ball into a, a goal. That was hockey. If you like hit the ball, jump in and, and, and throw a ball into a hoop, that was base, that was basketball. None of these games really took off until we get into the 80s where we start to have the console wars. So at this point, I got to introduce you to a guy named Trip Hawkins. Mm. Trip Hawkins was the founder of something called Electronic Arts. E now that might, it's, it's in, in the, the game. game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that sounds a lot familiar. That, that should sound familiar to a lot of people. Electronic Arts, essentially what they were doing was creating software for at the time, computers, which would then be called video games. So let me give you a quick dive on, on the founder of Electronic Arts and what makes him such an interesting character. Well, I mean, if his name doesn't make him interesting enough, Shoddy's name is Trip. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> right so Trip, Trip Hawkins, interesting, interesting guy. Um, he went to school at the same time that he uh, went to... I believe it was Stanford mm. and Bill Gates was in this, in that school at the same time. Now you said he didn't, he didn't meet Bill Gates, um, but they were in the school at the, around the same time. Um, worked at Apple. In fact, interesting story about how he worked at Apple. This is a little quick segue, but I just want you to give you an idea about who this guy is at the time. Home computers were have, hadn't taken off yet. And so trip was like, yo, I'm going to do a research paper on what home computers are. He, he, we approached a bunch of different marketing uh, firms who typically do this type of market research. And they're like, yo, what's a home computer? Like, bro, we, we, we don't, we don't, we're no, no, I work with some of the biggest manufacturers of computers and computer parts, and nobody's talking about home computers. So they're like, yo, you could do that as a side project, but we're going to have you do something else. So he did the other thing. And then a year later, his boss is like, yo, Home computers. You were talking about that, right? We need you to do a research project on home computers. So he starts doing his research project on home computers, reaching out to a whole bunch of different companies, Apple being one of them. And at the time, Apple was putting out a campaign, and this is like the early 80s, right? Apple's putting yeah. out a campaign saying they're the number one selling computer at the time. And that was actually a lie. So Trip, in his research, had found that out and Radio Shack, which was releasing a, a computer at the time, they actually had one of the number one selling computers. It wasn't the greatest, but they had the number one selling computer. And guess what? What happened? Somebody calls him and starts berating him on the phone. Trip? Yeah. They call they Trip and start berating him on the phone. Like, yo, what are you doing? Why are you running this? You're, you're ruining, you're giving me a bad name. Guess who that was? Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs. Wow. So Trip is like, well, I mean, it's in the research. You can read it or I can bring it to you guys and I can show you what I have in my in my research. And so Steve Jobs was like, you know what? Fine, bring it in. And then Trip is just like, yeah, and by the way, I'm also looking for a job. Wow. <laughs> so Steve Jobs and Finesse. Apple offer this guy a job. So that just gives you a little bit of insight into who this guy Trip Hawkins is. So let's break down the evo let's break down the evolution or should I say the founding of real sports video games right here. So yo Trip Hawkins, he's like a he's a technologically inclined individual. He's like an engineer or something of that nature. So he's not an engineer, but he understands computers and he understands marketing and sales. So he understands mm. how to talk to He's a software guy. He's mm -hmm. not an electrical engineer, but he's a software guy. So he understands how to talk to the software people, but he also is great at sales, great at marketing. Mm -hmm. So he was able to get people to do what he needed them to do with yeah. great and great communication skills. Mm -hmm. Leadership. So when he, when, yeah, exactly. So when he founded Electronic Arts, he wanted to create a football-based video game. 
and they spent tons and tons of resources on this. It just kept failing. It wasn't a great, uh, it wasn't a great story at all at the very beginning. He wanted to create a simulation game. They spent tons of technology. The technology wasn't there at the time. So what Trip actually went and did is he created a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. And this game released in 1983. It was called One-on-One -on -one Dr. J versus Larry Bird. This is one of the... Yo, I think I played a game. No, I don't. I didn't play this specific game. But this reminds me of a game that I used to play. I remember when I was younger and I had a Super Nintendo, which is obviously after this. And I played like half court basketball. It was some trash game with like six guys from the NBA, but it sounds familiar. It sounds similar to this. So this is probably the basis of that game that you played because essentially this was just Dr. J versus Larry Bird. And key fact here, um, Irving and Bird were each paid $25,000 to appear in this game um, and also got 2.5% royalties. Irving, however, got stocks in EA, which is huge. Mm. Yeah. That was one of the first players to ever get stocks in a company or ownership in a company for licensing out their brand. Uh, the game sold for $40, $40 USD and sold almost a million copies in its first year. So this was an absolute like home run grand slam when it comes to sports video games. This is the first time where a sports video game went nuclear. What, what year is this? This is 1983, so we're still in the early 80s, baby. 83, $40 million in 1983? Oh, yeah, my let's, goodness. Let's look at the inflation on that. <laughs> oh. So fast forward a little bit. In 1987, EA Sports also released a game called Earl Weaver Baseball. And Earl Weaver was a, a manager. He consulted on the, on the game. This is the first time that AI was being used at a high level to make a simulation sports video game. Mm. So Trip, being a guy that he is and always wanted to make a football game, said, aha. Yeah. We got to turn this into an actual football game. So he was like, yo, one of the best ways to push out a video game is to partner with a brand or partner yeah. with somebody who is with who's in the sport in the ecosystem yeah because last time they did that they worked with irving magic johnson and made uh i i checked the inflation adjusted amount yeah 121 million dollars inflation adjusted in 2023 dollars so um obviously the proof was in the pudding that yeah you could make video games and just sell pixels or you could sell personalities and allow people to put themselves in the shoes of their favorite superstar and you would sell way more. So you're saying when it came time to do football, they were looking for the biggest name in football. Absolutely. And who was the biggest name in football at the time? Joe Montana. Joe Montana. <laughs> you're like, Joe Montana. I mean, Joe Montana was a big, he was a big name, you know, Super so, Bowl winner, you know. The reason why they approached Joe Montana because he already had a deal with Atari and they had a Joe Montana game at the time and mm. you guys have to realize that at this time, these games weren't simulation football like we know them now with Madden 11 on 11. These were four on four, six on six, like a couple of plays in the game that you can run. They weren't the they weren't simulation football games. And so what Trip was trying to do was create the first simulation football game, but he didn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. So he approaches Joe Montana. Joe Montana says no. I'm already signed with Atari. He approaches Joe Cap. That's his second uh, person he approaches. Joe Cap wanted royalties at the time, and they were like, nah, we're not giving out royalties. So then he approaches somebody who is legendary in the game, John Madden. Mm. And when he approaches John Madden, Madden, Madden was interested because he thought this was a good way to teach fans about the game of football. In fact, he was actually running a course, uh, teaching a course about football at the time, which is completely the type of guy that John Madden is. He loves the game of football, and he always just wanted to immerse the fans into more football. So when he was creating the game, when he was partnering on the game to be like, okay, what is this about? I like this idea. This is great to teach football. Tripp was like, yeah, it's amazing. It's going to be six on six. And John was like, whoa, that's not mm. football. 
Right. He's like, football is 11 on 11. And Corey, in fact, if you look up the cover of John Madden from 1988, you will see, or uh, yeah, 1988, you will see the laws, uh, the rules of football or the laws of football by John Madden. And one of it says, it is not football if it is not 11 on 11. Wow. And, and John Madden is, for anybody who doesn't know, obviously... The, his namesake has lived on 30 plus years since uh, this inception here. In, when is this? Is we're right now in 1988, 1989-ish? Yeah, 1988 was when the game was released. Right. So his this game came out 30 years ago. But John Madden was not just a guy. Like he played in the NFL, but he actually his playing career ended before he ever had a chance to play in a regulation game. Like he was injured spent his uh, whole season recovering from injury, ended up spending a lot of time while he's recovering from injury, like in the film room, studying and whatnot, transitioned directly into coaching, goes on to be one of the winningest coaches in football history, period. Like he knows his stuff. And then after that, he becomes a brand name, household name uh, in in the broadcast industry. So John Madden is synonymous with football in, in two lanes as a coach and as a broadcaster. So I feel like that that's something that outside of the video game that Madden has almost become like a whole different thing. Like I'm going to go play Madden. It's, it used to be John Madden's football and now it's just Madden. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's almost synonymous with football itself. Um, we got to give that man his uh his little respect because he wouldn't have been there without being actually a credible authority on the sport itself in the first place so the game comes out 1989 yeah so 1989 is when the game comes out interesting enough this was the first the first madden was a pc game it released on the apple too a lot of people don't know that it took three years to develop because at the time the technology didn't allow for 11 on 11 football and it just had to be 11 on 11 football but what people will be familiar with anybody who's in the co who's like a console diehard 1990 john madden releases on the sega now interesting story here john madden football on genesis sold roughly 400,000 copies which exceeded the company's expectation they were expecting 75,000 copies sold 400,000 copies so here again ea does it and they blow projections out the water and they get another hit. But what I found this interesting, because when we're talking about the sports, the business of sports video games, you have to remember that there's a lot of money riding on the line. EA did not want to pay a licensing fee for every cartridge that of the video game that they sold. So I'll break this down very quickly. When a console, ha um, so Sega has a console, and if you want to build a game on their platform, you have to pay 8 to $10 at the time to sell a video game through their cartridge. So let's say EA is selling a video game for $40. They have to pay Sega or who else eight to $10 every time they sell a Sega cartridge. Mm -hmm. EA was like, nah, we don't want to do that. So they were reverse engineering the console. They were going to release their own console. EA was going to put out their own console. Yeah. They were going to put out their own console with Madden but Sega was like, ah, you know what? Like, we're going to lose so much business. They reduced their licensing fee to $2. Wow. And a $2 million cap on the fee. Wow. Okay, so they took it down 75% and then said, you know what? We'll we'll limit your risk here because the top top you're going to have to pay us is $2 million. Yeah. And the cons they they agreed, and after that, EA yo the rest is history. They saved thirty five million dollars over the next three years of that deal. So from nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety three, they saved thirty five million dollars. So you were talking about uh, SNES, Super Nintendo. In nineteen ninety two, we get the Bulls versus Blazers and the NBA playoffs. This would be the basis of what would eventually become NBA Live. In 1988 to 1995, the personal computer is starting to get amazing. Like we're talking technology is allowing us to be, have real 
sports simulations where the players actually look like the players. The game actually plays like the game because the, the gameplay is, is, is fluid. And then we enter the golden era. Mm -hmm. 1997 to 2004 that's when you you know that's when i became a super fan of video games that's when the playstation comes out the playstation 2 the xbox sega dreamcast the nintendo mm -hmm. 64 and mm -hmm. we start to jump into 32 and 64 bit gaming which allowed for 3d gaming so yeah. we get sports like we get sports games like tony hawk's pro skater yo can we just stop everything right there <laughs> let's go T H P S Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Listen, I remember when I first got this game, I used to get uh these magazines. Okay. I used to go to the store and buy these magazines. And the magazines would have walkthroughs of how you beat these different video games, Metal Gear Solid or Spyro the Dragon or whatever it is. And you would get a demo disc inside of this magazine and it would have like two games on it. And one of the games that was on this demo disc was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And you could only play for like five minutes on one level and then the game had to reset over again. And so I remember playing on PlayStation 1 and just hitting this half pipe and they were playing some rock music I had never heard before. I like, look, I had never listened to no damn rock music, but when I got on that skateboard and I hit that vert, Oh, you might as well, dude. I might as well have been born in the, born in that that whole culture, bro. I was swallowed up by skate culture because of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and I know I'm not the only one. Because hundred oh, percent, I think like that that love for um just like extreme sports was kind of born there with those demo discs. I went on to, of course, buy the game, play all the whole franchise, and it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was extremely lucrative based on oh. the research we we've, we've done over here to see extremely lucrative and not only for the franchise but for tony hawk so he was initially offered 500k for his likeness but he turned it down and off and opted for royalties which is the best thing you could ever do mm. always try to get the royalties on your likeness in the end he ended up making four million dollars wow for the that's, entire Tony Hawk's Pro Skater franchise. That's so, eight, eight, eight times more return than he would have got for the, the money up front. Yeah. So, like, easily a win for him. A um, couple of games that you guys also might be familiar with. Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr., mm. SSX, NBA Jam, which, whoo, bro, NBA Jam was one of my favorite games to play at the time. Uh, yo, this game was insanely, insanely successful. Collecting one billion dollars worth of quarters between 1993 and 1994, brother, that is a <laughs> lot of quarters. Yo, have right? you, ever, you ever rolled up coins when you used to have a piggy bank? You used to, <laughs> used to put the quarters in that little paper and roll them up and bring them to the bank. Oh, somebody's fingers were bleeding, bleeding, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Holy man, that was that was uh, yeah, that was insane. In in total, eight billion quarters. Oh man, two billion dollars uh to date. That's yeah. crazy. So that's, crazy. that's insane. 2004, big, big year, guys. Um many different companies used to release sports games. You had ESPN NFL 2K, you had Madden by EA, you had football manager by Sega. You had M ESPN NBA 2K, NBA Live, NBA Ballers, if you remember that. Oh, I remember NBA Street, NFL yep. Street. I remember those ones too. Um, those were a lot of there were a lot of games that came out. That was a golden era for sure. Even Barely. I remember with the Dreamcast. Um, what was that boxing game called? Would have had a guy with a big afro. Do you remember this game? What was I, that? That's all ringing about. Oh my gosh, I am drawing a blank right now. Boxing game for Dreamcast. I'm going to be mad that I don't remember the name. It's called Ready to Rumble. Ooh. Do you ever play Ready to Rumble? No, I never played that. Yo, I might have to buy a Dreamcast just for us to play that. Yo, if you ever played Ready to Rumble, you got to like and subscribe. This is this is <laughs> this is this is one of the best games ever. Yeah. Definitely the best game that was for Dreamcast, but anyways, we, we so, I digress. <laughs> in 2004, at the end of 2004, this is where things start to shape the modern era 
of sports video games. All right. And this is where we start to jump into what the purpose of this podcast episode is. December 13, 2004, EA Sports signs an exclusive deal with the NFL, which means that Madden is now the only NFL sim on the market. This was such a huge, huge splash, huge wave in the industry that 2K was like, nah, nah, we're signing an exclusive deal with MLB. Mm -hmm. So that was their response. And so now we move into 2005. We'll, we'll dive more deeper into the licensing game. But in 2005 to today is where you get all of your modern sports. You get your NBA 2K. You get your FIFA, no longer called FIFA, FC. You get mm. um, NCAA football. That's coming back. In July. You get, yeah. You get um, your sports games like your Formula One racing, mm -hmm. NHL, MLB The Show. UFC. Like all the UFC. So all of these games, if you look at them, they're usually only made by one studio because they have a lot of these exclusive licensing deals. So, yeah. Courtney. Yes. You are the businessman. Yes. Can you explain to us the licensing business model and why it is so lucrative? Yeah. So you, you really introduced the whole concept. And I think a lot of this business jargon is talking over people's head about things that could be explained very simply. At the end of the day, licensing is just an agreement that allows one party to use and earn revenue from something that is owned by another party. So I can license your content to sell it and make money. I just have to share some of that profit with you in the form of a royalty. Okay. So licensing agreements generate revenues that are called royalties. And they're earned by the company who owns the copyrighted or patented material. Things that could be licensed. Very popular is like people would license their songs to a movie, for example. And when a movie comes on and you hear that song by that famous artist, the artist is going to earn a royalty for that because they gave the movie producer the license to use their song right sports teams license out their brands their logos their likeness players names jersey numbers signatures those things are intellectual property the software the technology that can be licensed out so really all this is is a, a type of partnership where one group is saying hey look you got this thing over there and you're using it but i have a different way that we could use it that it might be easier for me to execute than you. Just like EA will go to um, the NFL and say, look, you got all these players over there who have star power and you don't know how to make a video game, but I know how to make a video game. So I'm going to pay you NFL. EA Sports is going to pay the NFL and the NFL is going to license the likeness of those players, their jersey numbers, their names, their images, their, their faces. And EA is going to have the right to make money off of that likeness. And all they have to do is make sure they pay some money to the people who own that likeness, that intellectual property, right? So this is the licensing business model. It's a partnership. One person is entering a new market or extending the reach of an existing uh, intellectual property or an existing patent. And so why is this different than a promotional collaboration? Because you might say, well, you know, players, they do promos all the time. They show up in a, in a certain car and they get paid for being in a car. That's, that's not the same. A royalty is where you're going to get paid either for a set period of time or in perpetuity in relation to the amount of revenue that is driven off of your likeness, right? So say, for example, uh, you know, we take somebody else's music and we use it to do this big event. Well, they're not going to license it to us at the same price that they would license it to MGM Studios because MGM is going to make so much more money off of that. They they have millions of viewers, right? So the fee for that, they're going to take into consideration like, look guys, you guys are making a ton of money. You can use our stuff however you want, but it has to be within these certain guidelines. And we're not just going to show up and take pictures. You're going to you're going to take it, you're going to use it but the royalty has to come back to us, right? Um, people have seen in the past, like many of the examples you laid out, the power of these stars. And why do these leagues wanna work with 
um, the the EA Sports and other companies because they're building fans. And why do EA Sports and them want to work with these leagues? Because athletes drive higher engagement than just brands themselves do. So you can say we work with the NFL and that's cool, but to have a game that just said NFL football and then all of the players are just kind of uh, generic characters, that wouldn't hit the same. The fact that you could run around with Michael Vick in Madden or you could use uh, you know, LeBron James in NBA 2K, the fact that you could play with these heroes that you saw on the screen and you could pretend that you were them like – those athletes would drive a way higher engagement. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that up to 11 times higher engagement when fans interact with the directly with the athlete than with the brand itself. And specifically, the NFL athletes drive 20 times higher engagement than the league, the NFL league itself, and 15 times higher than the teams. So we've talked about this at length before, but these are player-driven leagues. That's why they want the guys to take their helmet off, be in the commercials, show their face, smile for the camera. It's because fans get attached to other people and not just the banners. All right, so now let's look at how the NFL is, you know, understanding this and leveraging this. At the league level, they make money from merchandise, licensing, and broadcast. Broadcast is another form of licensing, but um, that gets split between all the 32 teams. Those are the biggest income sources for the NFL specifically. Now, at the team level, they make money from like, you know, selling beer and hot dogs, ticket sales, and like corporate partnerships. But really what drives the NFL and the franchise valuations and what drives the 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 insane amounts of revenue that you see it all comes from licensing, which also includes the broadcast deals and giving people the right to use their intellectual property, to use that game and sell that game to be distributed. And then other companies, broadcast companies, ESPN, ABC, Peacock, they can run commercials during the broadcast. People want to show up and watch NFL football. Okay, cool. While you're watching this, we're going to take a break for 90 seconds and we're going to show you an ad for this car. We're going to show you an ad for this, this tool. We're going to show you an ad for this other thing. And that's how the broadcast companies make money. But without the intellectual property that the NFL is licensing to them, making available for distribution, nobody's watching that commercial. That's why the Super Bowl commercials cost so much money is because you guarantee that there's going to be people watching those ads, right? Cause at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself what, what business is everybody in on one end of the partnership? They're in the attention grabbing business. That's for EA. That's for the broadcast networks. That's for fanatics or whoever they're trying to grab attention. And on the other end, on the NFL end, on the NBA end, on the uh, the soccer end, they're trying to expand their fandom, right? So this is a true partnership where both sides are are growing. At the time, let let me just give you a a little bit of context of how much how how big these partnerships are. At the time of John Madden's death in 2021, which was about 30 years after the inception, 32 years after the game first came out, Madden sold over 130 million copies. 130 million copies. And through the sale of those games, all the microtransactions, et cetera, a staggering $7 billion huh. in revenue for EA. Now, you tell me if that's a healthy partnership. That is a super healthy partnership. And and how much work do you think the NFL really had to put in other than licensing out their likeness, making their players available to shoot some videos and do some content. And then after the licensing was done to do some endorsement of that video game. And how many fans do you think not only were created in the first place, because not every fan can make it to Arrowhead stadium or can make it to giant stadium or can make it to wherever the venue is. The majority of fans never make it into the stadium. Yeah. And they can only turn on the TV for 18 weeks 
during the season. But with a video game like Madden on their own time, three o'clock in the morning, in the middle of summer, they can pretend to be Patrick Mahomes. And that drives a deeper level of engagement. So that's $7 billion that they sold for EA Sports, man, whatever cut Madden uh, gave to e, uh, gave to the NFL, the NFL is laughing because that's money that they would not have made otherwise. Yeah, no, crazy, crazy deal. In fact, this deal is so crazy that John Madden said he regrets not buying into EA at the time because Trippett approached him and said, hey, like, do you want to buy into the shares before we do an IPO? And they did a, their IPO in uh, 1989. And John Madden was like, yo, listen, I gave you my time. I'm not giving you my money. I'm just a football coach. And he regretted that because like uh, EA which selling at $7.50 a share in 1989. What are they what are they trading at now? Well, um right now it's it's trading at $136, but that's not accounting for um share splits, right? All time EA stock is up 27,224%. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I call that regrettable 27,000% return. I don't know how many X's that is, but, um, that's a lot of money, but you know, it's not, it's not like John Madden went broke off this, right? They were making a lot of money in 2005, which was, uh, 20, 25 years, 15 years after, uh, the game first came out, they said, look, Madden. Yeah, public math isn't my thing. But like what from all the 90s and then another five years brings us to 2005. So 15 years, they said, look, John, we're going to give you $150 million and just say, you know, no more royalties because you're really killing us right now. But we're going to give you $150 million and we're going to be able to use your likeness in perpetuity. And he took that deal. So John Madden, um, definitely a pioneer in the sports video game industry also, you know, set the bar for a lot of the licensing that was done because his namesake is synonymous. His, his name is synonymous with football now. And I think it's because the game was such high quality. It gave fans a chance to really just be a, be live all their dreams in such a way. Now we are talking about the NFL a lot, the NFL specifically, they don't necessarily own all of these trademarks. I've been saying that they do, but really the NFLPA, the Players Association, owns m most of these trademarks that we're actually talking about when we're talking about the players themselves. So the NFL, they would own uh, like the team logos and things of that nature, and they would package those up and they would be able to sell those and they would be able to sell the on-field product. But the likeness of Michael Vick, the likeness of Randy Moss, the likeness of um, Tom Brady, those royalties are paid through the NFLPA and they're licensed by the NFLPA. And some of the other no notable licensees of the NFLPA's um, intellectual property would be like 2K because as a basketball game, you can actually go and buy a football jersey inside of the game. Um, you've got product integrations, which is a whole nother thing that I'm sure Trip was thinking about, but they weren't doing back in the day. So we can get into that in a minute, but like the Associated Press, which is a media publication, like, uh, Beast Mode, that's Marshawn Lynch's clothing line, uh, Dapper Labs, who created, um, uh, you know, the NFTs with the, N with the NFL NFTs, you got Fatheads, they make posters, DraftKings Rainmakers, which is some other NFTs. Hasbro, they make toys for kids. Hallmark, Fanatics, they do all kinds of jerseys for every league. NHL is going to be the next one they're doing, but MLB. Um, and these, these might be Nike jerseys. You might be like, these are Nike jerseys. They're produced by Fanatics. Okay, Fanatics is actually taking over. Fanatics is actually starting to do uh, trading cards as well. So they have licensing for a, a lot of those things. Mattel, Lids, Stride Line, they make socks. TaylorMade, Nike, Under Armour, humongous brands 
all some of the NFLPA's most notable licensees. And so obviously based on that list, you can tell that apparel is one of the biggest categories. And so the ability to put a player's number and name on a jersey makes that piece of cotton and polyester so much more valuable. Recently, they talked about Angel Reese being the first college athlete to have her own personal line of clothes and merchandise available, I think was Dick Sporting Goods, like in, in retail locations. Um, so that just speaks to the power that athletes have now in licensing out their name image likeness. Um, and these are things that started in the video game industry, really. So I think this is a good time to talk about some interesting uh, stories. Because I remember playing NBA Live and there was always this one player that I'm like, yo, this guy is goaded, but there's no name on him. Player 99. Who yeah. the hell is Player 99 in all of these NBA Live games? Can you can you share a bit of what you what you learned about Michael Jordan and him controlling his his brand and his likeness in the sports video game era? Well, really, I think what it came down to is a simple fact that Michael Jordan was the one of the first people to truly recognize the power that his personal brand had. If you remember when the Jordan sneakers came out and Nike gave Jordan the ones to wear, they were a direct violation of the uniform code of the NBA, yet and still he wore them Nike paid the fine for him. This is a legendary story. Legendary. And they went on to be the best-selling shoe ever at that point in time, right? And I don't know what the numbers are now. This isn't really a shoes episode, but I'd argue... I mean, I wore Jordan 1s to work today, okay? So, like, I'm sure they're still doing pretty well. And it wasn't because they were just these cool red, white, and black shoes. It was because they were Michael Jordan's shoe. So he understood the power of his brand. And when all of this licensing stuff was changing in the early 90s and these big companies were starting to throw guys' names in there, Mike was saying, look, my name doesn't carry the same amount of weight as everybody else's name. The same way how I was saying, you know, MGM Studios and the MVP podcast aren't necessarily going to command the same royalties if we're if we're to license out our intellectual property michael jordan was saying i am not going to sign an agreement with the pa that's going to allow them to just put my name and my image and my likeness in a video game because people would get that video game for me alone yeah. they're not getting that game for whoever else is out there trying to guard me they're getting the game so they could be like mike and so he actually denied denied others the ability to license his name image and likeness for a very long time and that's how you got player 99 it was you could be scotty you could be dennis rodman you could be robert ori shoot you could be the whole squad matter of fact you could also be a guy who was kind of like michael jordan <laughs> but you couldn't be mike because yeah. he wouldn't let you because they weren't trying to pay him anything different than what the rest of the people in the league got paid. And he felt that he was worth more than that. So eventually he came around and there was other game modes in NBA Live where you could specifically use Michael Jordan in a in like a one-on-one -on -one yeah. situation. And that was kind of like the icebreaker where he eventually did start coming back into the video games. And I think when that happened, it was a big draw for people to get back on NBA Live because, man, you can finally be like Mike. Yeah. And now if you play video games, you know, whether it's FIFA, whether it's Madden, whether it's 2K, there's always modes that are outside of the regular 5-on-5 five five or 11-on-11. 11 11. There's modes where you can play in the street, you can play 3-on-3, three three, you can play pickup, you can do a career mode or a story mode. And I think that all started back... You know, when you could try and be like Mike or play against Mike, um, maybe maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but that definitely made it more popular for those off the beat path game modes. But he understood the power of his brand. And I think he was kind of being a jerk about it because he was already rich. But you can't fault the guy 
for knowing that, you know, this, this is a new phenomenon. Yeah. This whole thing where guys are just signing their life away and taking a small check. He knew he was worth a lot more and he expected a lot more. And so that's why in the nineties, we never got to play with Michael Jordan in a video game really. Yeah. There were no, there were very little simulation basketball games where you could play like Mike, where you could be like Mike. It was funny when I was doing my research, I saw a game where you were dri dribbling a basketball has Jordan around the streets and sewers of Chicago fighting like, I don't know, like aliens or beasts or something like that. I can't remember what Stop the game this. was called, but I, it was so funny to see something like that. Like video game companies and um, developer studios, like they were doing madness. They were doing anything that they could to just appeal to a new generation of, of young consumers, young gamers. And they were just partnering with anybody who had a name and creating all types of, uh, of video games. It's kind of, it's interesting. It, it really brought me down memory lane when we were talking about that. Now, this whole thing started uh, with you playing FC24, which I, mm -hmm. I got to jump into. I haven't played FC24. So good. It's so good. It's, it's, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an NBA 2K diehard, but I have not been playing that much. And so now I want to jump into <laughs> FC. I want to play the My Player mode, but What's interesting is that like FIFA is the most dominant mm -hmm. sports video game of all time. Yes. Does this have anything to do with why EA is like, yo, we can just drop the FIFA and yeah. go with FC? Well, I mean, you you take this for what it's worth, but FIFA originally came out in 1993 shortly after Madden, a few years later. And it has sold 325 million copies since its inception. All right. Now, I don't, I don't know what you think, but I have a theory that if you make a video game that has teams from all over the world, it's going to be marketable all over the world. Because it wasn't until recent history and even still if we're realistic soccer in the united states of america is not the biggest sport and so for an american company to create the biggest soccer game in the world is more a testament to the american technology and their understanding of the business of sports and licensing more so than their prowess on the pitch and so fifa from 1993 all the way up until 2003 was named after the governing body that oversees all of the major professional leagues, tournaments, and clubs that play soccer or what you would call football all over the world. Now, the previous deal that expired in 2023, EA had to pay FIFA $150 million dollars for that name so they could call their video game fifa 23 fifa Damn. 22 fifa 21 but when they came up for contract renewal fifa said look yesterday's price is not today's price you guys are gonna have to pay us 300 million double and ea kind of balked at that and said why are we gonna pay you double when you're not even giving us exclusivity in the licensing agreement that we have because FIFA had also licensed, had their IP to Fortnite and Roblox, which are two of the biggest video games outside of the sports world. Yeah. So one, you can't really fault FIFA for working with those other video games because they're kind of in a different category. But if you're not going to give exclusivity, how can you charge that premium and ea said you know what we actually have 300 plus other licensing partners across the soccer world including clubs leagues tournaments so they could still use the likeness of players and team brands and trophies and all of that stuff so they could keep going without missing a beat without having the graces of fifa giving them that title to use so in 2024, for the first time ever, 
EA Sports soccer game was called EA Sports FC 24. They did a complete rebrand. Yet, you could go in there, you can play with national teams, you could play Premier League, UEFA Champions League, UEFA Women's Champions League, La Liga, Bundesliga, League One, Syria. Like they have NWSL, whatever you want to play. I think the only team you can't really play with is like Juventus and a couple of other teams. But there is 300 licensing partners that make EA Sports FC 24 absolutely the best simulation soccer game in the world, bar none. And not only that, but in a part of this rebrand, EA Sports is investing back into local soccer communities because what is this licensing thing all about? We talked about it. It's so that kids and fans can grow a deeper attachment to these different clubs that are allowing the licensed partners, right? Like Premier League wants little kids to pretend to be soccer and Odegaard and I want to dream to be on Arsenal. I want to play for West Ham or whatever. I want to be a fan of... Chelsea and whatever the EPL is hoping to to drive fandom through this video game and that's why they allow EA to pay them for these licensing rights and so EA also knows look if we go into these communities we're donating 10 million dollars globally to support grassroots football that's only going to help drive the growth of the game and the engagement mm -hmm. and build an affinity with these young fans so they've got this thing called the FC Futures they're donating money back into community. They've they've had partnerships with UEFA, which is the Union of European Football Associations, which is kind of like a smaller version of FIFA. Yeah. So I think EA Sports has taken a strategic move here, and they went Frank Lucas, and they just said like, "Yo, we're cutting out the middleman, and we're going straight to the source." And I think FIFA is one of those situations where they got greedy, and they might try coming back, but um, that's that's a a new brand in the video game industry. And I'm kind of glad that I stumbled across it because I would have never realized any of the stuff we talked about today if I didn't first pick up that game on that Boxing Week sale and ask myself, why the hell is FIFA not called FIFA anymore? Yeah, that that was a shock to me when I saw that news. It It's interesting because after listening to, or as we're doing this podcast, and taking in this information, EA had a lot of leverage, and FIFA did not have that much leverage in this in this uh, um, negotiation to ask for double. And also, what's interesting now is that FIFA has literally just chopped off like their branding distribution, like by like they've put it on life support like every four years now because FIFA only shows up every four years when the World Cup is coming on. For diehard sports fans, like diehard soccer fans, FIFA, the video game, was reaching millions and millions of people every single year. So it's kind of interesting now that that is uh, they're going to essentially lose that opportunity to continue to market their brand on a, a yearly basis with young, impressionable fans. Questionable choices over there. The green yeah. really really got to them well so soccer is humongous right and you got to understand like fifa is the governing body that oversees every league professional league like even mm -hmm. canadian premier league to mls to uh, all the leagues in south america africa china like they're all under fifa so fifa is getting their bread don't get it twisted and they oh, also own the rights of the largest sports property in the entire world because the world cup is bigger than the olympics and it's not even close so um, FIFA, they, they're like a big bad wolf, you know, they're not afraid of anybody and they're going to get there. So, you know, power to them. But I do think that it is a loss in breaking into the places where you could call them like football emerging markets. North uh, America is not the biggest soccer countries, group of countries. Like in Mexico, it's pretty big. In America, it's growing. In Canada, it's growing. Um, but you know, if you go into Europe, it's very saturated and they yeah. need other avenues of introducing fans to the game. Like we mentioned, like EPL games are coming on nine o'clock in the morning, 10 in the morning. It's cool, but it's not the same as, you know, football where everybody, they plan appointments around the Sunday NFL 
calendar, right? Yeah. So they need different things to help marketing. But hell, how am I going to tell them what to do? Because yeah. they're already got the biggest sports property in the world and it's not by accident. So I think EA is smart. And instead of going with their handout begging, then they're they're putting down the gauntlet and saying, you know what, we're going to go directly to the Women's Super League. We're going to go directly to Syria, to UEFA, Women's Champions League, to whatever. Um, and they're going to create a great game and they're going to have to pay less money in licensing because they're going to save that $150 million right there. But they're going to take a sliver of that and they're giving it right back to the community. I think it's a win for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. We've, we've done a lot here. Let's, what's our takeaways from all of this? Man, I I think my my biggest takeaway is that the key to explosive growth and like meaningful growth is rooted in true partnerships. And this is when, you know, both the licensor and the licensee are equally invested and they're both getting a return. I see from the early days of the Magic Johnson versus Larry Bird, you know, those two guys brought their brand to the table and the video game like company, Trip Hawkins and and his harebrained genius was like, I can help elevate you guys to the next level in a way that you haven't been able to elevate yet. So he's bringing something that they can't do. They're bringing a cachet that he doesn't have. And together that synergy, it's a real one plus one equals three situation. And that's how you grow is by alignment of incentives and true partnership. Not this one, one direction stuff like FIFA was trying to do. Just mm -hmm. like pay us a whole bunch of money and we'll just sit back and collect checks. But a true partnership in that, you know, the NFL is growing with a younger demographic because of video games. And everybody knows that, you know, an aging fan base is less than ideal and you got to get a way to get into the next generation. The way that people are not going to games in the same way or they're not sitting down and watching a full game. They want to consume shorter content, more on demand stuff. A video game feels like part of a solution to that problem and i think partnership is you know a real underlying theme across this whole thing for uh businesses that are trying to grow together yeah but one of my what, key yeah i was gonna say what is your what is your key takeaway from this yeah one of my key takeaways is or not even a, a takeaway but shout out to john madden mm. shout out to that guy for pushing for a realistic simulation games and not accepting you know the basic 6v6 or whatever it is he went in there and said okay i want this to be a simulation game and trip hawkins said okay we're not going to release the game right away we're going to wait three years for the technology we're going to develop it we're going to build a solid game and for me i feel like john madden was essentially kind of like the pioneer in, in a sense mm -hmm. or maybe not say a pioneer but we could say that he spearheaded the push for mm -hmm. like more realistic simulation games. And that's how we get the Madden of today, the NBA 2K of today, the MLB and so on and so forth. So with that being said, yeah, I got a question for you. Yeah. What's your Mount Rushmore mm. of sports video game icons? Oh, oh man. Well, look, I just got to start right where you left off, man. If, if you're talking about, John Madden, who in his coaching career, 103 wins, 32 losses. That's like a 75% of the time he's going to win. He won a Super Bowl. He brought crazy cachet into this thing. His reputation was so high. It was right up there with a guy like Irving Magic Johnson or Larry Bird, if not bigger. Like he was probably one of the biggest names to do something. And he went all in. I think John Madden and the demands that he put on Trip Hawkins, who was also in his own right, a pioneer. But I think him not settling for less, we're all better off because John Madden wouldn't settle for less. And so I got to put John Madden up there on the uh, video game, sports video game Mount Rushmore, because he demanded that we had a simulation game that allowed us to live out our dreams as our favorite players. But yeah, who else? Mount Rushmore I has four heads on it. Yeah, I'm definitely putting Trip Hawkins on there. Like, this this guy is an evil genius when mm. it comes to sports video games. 
EA Sports, it's in the game. I've been saying that for like 20 plus years now. It's mm. engraved in my heart. There are there all the EA games that I've ever played that were very close to my heart. Madden, NBA Live. I hope they come back one day. Um, but this guy, Simulation Sports, he is the pioneer of simulation sports when it comes to modern gaming. Everybody else follows what EA Sports does. EA Sports is one of the biggest sports video game companies in the world. Like, thank you, Trip Hawkins. Thank you. Yeah. I, I didn't know your name before I started doing this research, mm -hmm. but now I salute you and I say thank mm -hmm. you for all your mm -hmm. hard work and what you've done because you made my childhood mm. memorable and exceptional. Mm. Mm. And Shout out wasn't, wasn't NBA Street also an EA Sports game? Yeah. Yeah, like trip. You did you went crazy. But you know crazy. what? I also have to put up on that Mount Rushmore. The person who had me in a chokehold in my mom's basement on a 18 inch screen, you know, playing five minutes at a time and then resetting the game and playing it again. Tony Hawk, because it was it was like one of the first video games where I started thinking about, man, I had no idea about this world of skateboarding and now I'm all in. He really introduced me to the concept of skateboarding in, in a deeper way. Like I knew what it was. It's not like I lived on the moon, but that was one of the games that really made you feel like I, I became a fan mm -hmm. of an entire genre of sport from a video game. And I know I'm not alone on this. Me and my friends were playing that one over and over and over again. And um, that was just one of the coolest games that gave you a chance to do something that in real life was really, really hard to do. Yeah. But in the video game, you felt like, man, I can hit that three flip and then drop down on a on a railing and just hit that, you know, front side, whatever. Like it was just a true liberating feeling to do something you never could do in real life. I I love I love Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And so Tony Hawk is on my Mount Rushmore of video game icons. I don't know yeah. how you feel about that one. No, no, I 100% agree with you. Listen, I have, I'm not gonna say I've never been on a skateboard. I've tried to skateboard, but I've never made it more than a meter. But listen, man, when, when I was Tony Hawk, when I was in them games, I was doing 720s. I mm. was doing half pipes, grinding off, doing all types of different things in that game. Listen, I watch extreme sports for for skateboarding because of that game. Right. Like when you're talking about when we were talking about why do these brands and these partnerships exist, it's because they're trying to penetrate emerging markets and get loyal fans. That's what Tony Hawk Pro Skater did for me. I wasn't gonna I wasn't a guy that wanted to be a skateboarder, but after playing the video game, I wanted to learn more about skateboarding. So shout out to Tony Hawk. He's definitely, definitely certified on that list the last one that i would give this is a opinion base i'm interested to hear what you guys think drop your comments in below who would you put on your mount rushmore of sports video game icons but this is mine one opinion 100 percent. michael vick mm. arguably the most unguardable unguardable quarterback in madden history player like he's a cheat code yeah he's a he was a cheat code you could throw the ball at 80 freaking yards off of the off the off of Atlanta. just taking a knee Atlanta was un, unstoppable Atlanta you could Falcons, run the ball with Michael this guy Vick was a Yo, beast. Michael Vick beast. made Madden super fun I don't think I don't think before then the game was as exciting but when they put him in there the game was super exciting you could do unthinkable things from the quarterback position where everything mm. started from so I have to give it to Michael Vick he was undeniably probably the best Madden player of all time. Like there's John, there, we make this joke, there's Peyton Manning, he was like unsackable. Mm. But then there's Michael Vick and you were like, is this how it feels to be a god amongst Yo, men? He was literally, it's like when he hit the turbo, like instead of getting to 100% speed, he got to like 110% speed and everybody else, like what the hell? Like he just, he was left-handed too. So it, I don't know. It just, it just looked cool. You can hurt them. The play, they had the playmaker mode. So while you're scrambling, you could tell the receiver to change directions with the right stick. Like, yeah, Mike Mike Vick did that thing, man. He was, he might as well have had a cape on. 
Yeah. He was a god amongst men. He was amazing. So, yeah, I think that's it. John Madden, Trip Hawkins, Tony Hawk, Michael Vick, Mount Rushmore, sports video games icons. If you if you have any others that we missed, definitely let us know. But, yeah, that's, that's the long, long story of why FIFA is no longer FIFA, the evolution of video games, the man who brought us EA, the brands behind the game, and the stories of the icons in the games. And this is the MVP podcast where we break down business and sports, man. So Yeah, if you guys enjoyed that as much as we did creating this, do us a favor. It's absolutely free. Like the video, subscribe on YouTube, hit the follow on, on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. That helps us grow. That helps the channel grow. That helps the podcast grow and get it to new people so they can be a part of the community too. Hey, do we we got to come up with a name for the community. So if you guys have any ideas, drop that also in the comment as well. But without further ado, we are out of here. See you guys on the next one. Peace.